Okay, welcome everybody to the November 21st meeting OSC Dev Team. So if you want to look at the working doc, it's uh, pasted. So that's the working doc. We've got a few people on today. So basics for today. Um, we've got a little slump in our participation at this point. Uh, we had a nice spike at, at the tractor build. We're kind of going again towards the end of the year. So we got to just got to continue so some of the activities that are happening are so there's for today we have OSC dev workbench micro track field testing continuing work on live track as far as the geometry and then saudi arabia d3d as far as the 3d printer build in saudi arabia and then really planning out the the year for next year so right now uh, pretty much the last workshop for the the year has happened and uh, I, I can't really share my screen so you guys please uh look at the I don't think I have enough bandwidth here right now, but as far as the last last look at look into the work document there. So last workshop has happened, and I'm thinking a lot about the schedule for next year and really making it ambitious and and trying to get to regular workshops on, on a lot of the workshops like the 3D printer we ran a lot last year. We're going to continue with that, but also we have at least like two builds of the brick press. I want to do several of the tractor. So try to stack the schedule with with a lot of good events including the possibility of some getting back to the core of Open Building Institute work, which which is houses and aquaponic greenhouses, which are we know so far that's been like the most interest people had were an aquaponic house and greenhouse. Uh, aquaponic house, aqu aqu the aquaponic house, yeah, which has both house and greenhouse elements and a lot of the utilities work that we're doing on it, uh, like the hydronic stove that's right now uh, working quite well. We've got a lot of reporting to do on that in terms of documenting all the systems and still finishing some of that work up. But um, a lot of that is very exciting. Thinking about how to roll out for next year, including the, the some some of the exciting elements like like really accelerating the development speed. I'm hoping that the dev team could actually increase quite a bit when we spawn the Hero X. So that's in planning the Hero X Open Source Micro Factory Challenge, crowd crowd fund crowd sourced crowd funded crowd design so that's herox.com but we're definitely going to post on that. that that could be a real breakthrough in terms of development based on the the crowdsourcing concept where i mean right now we're open to public contribution but um the the concept of a design challenge where you offer a bounty where the bounty is also crowdsourced crowdfunded that could be a big hit so so i look forward to that and seeing how well that works and just really trying to get the, the regular schedule and for September starting an immersion program. So how, would, how will that look? Don't know yet. I mean, just uh, the idea is that so far, you know, there's been various random uh, replications around the world of the project. But as far as people getting their full livelihood from this work, there's very few. It's pr pretty much myself. Katerina is doing that uh, related work full time. But we really got to spawn up. Uh, many other people and I think the business models are, are robust I mean much significantly lower cost for different things and the extreme manufacturing workshop concept I think that that pretty much all works and uh, it really would take the business development on that like marketing and really business startup incubation of startups that can do this kind of work but but I think we're convinced that this stuff works I mean um, and I think there's, of course, all the elements like getting the products to a high quality and online presence, websites and so forth that make it all happen. Um, but yeah, that's that's just a brief overview. But right now it's like, you know, we're on a lot of things. We're still at the R&D phase, you know, like we're co constantly developing stuff. But at the same time, we have to stabilize some things such, such that we can generate revenue to feed feed resources back into the project. So. Um, and thank you for taking the notes, uh, Lex. Uh, that's good. So, on on the plate right now, we've got. Uh, I mean, the, as far as the replications, I mean, the Saudi Arabia build, and then then uh, Costa Rica, where we're looking at the tractor and and brick press build for for March, which uh, I'm going to visit them in a, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go down there and check out what the situation there is. But a satellite facility would be awesome. So, I mean, satellite facilities. But the limiting limiting item being if people are going to do our work, I mean, there is a lot of training that people have to undergo, like from open culture to open tools 
to the different business models and the technologies themselves. It's highly integrated. So a lot of training is required unless people just kind of take stuff on their own. But we're seeing that people are not particularly taking stuff stuff on their own. So we really have to provide much more support to make that happen. All right. But let's let's just dive into um, just one more comment on the, the net neutrality thing. Like just the last, just what my situation here is right now. Right now I'm in a CD eco home using the internet here and we got satellite here but they cut off our internet downstairs because of a payment mess up because my bank got hacked and then the OSC bank account got hacked and I just fixed that but in the meantime um, they cut off our internet so uh, that's all fixed and all good but it made me think it's like through the 10 years that we are here the internet has not gone down it's it's like supposedly you've got Moore's law on the computers that you you double computer speed and, and internet speeds and all that every year but the price is actually not coming down and so it made me think about that I'm thinking hmm that's interesting and then I looked into net neutrality and like who owns the net right who owns the net at the end of the day can you take the OSC trencher dig some dig some uh, trenches and lay down fiber optic cable and start making your own internet I mean who really owns it how do you connect to it and so forth that's a lot of, a lot of mystery there and then there's land internet, there's satellite, there's there's cable, which is like RF through physical cables. There's a lot of different options. But and then today I, there's an article in uh, Wired about a big blow to to net neutrality happening, likely to happen. I mean that's a major thing. That's a big deal. Net neutrality that that whatever the content you pump it through at the same speed, not favor one piece of content over the other. Essentially, meaning that corporations are going to own what you see 100 percent on the internet instead of everyone having equal access so this thing is was an FCC Federal Communications Commission ruling coming up or some decisions to be made and it's like looks like a blow for net neutrality here so that's that's not good uh, and then it makes me think okay well let's let's uh, let's think about how we address that in the future because I do believe that 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 fight of the good old fight of good versus evil always is gonna have to happen and that's why we're doing open source ecology to provide low cost access to all kinds of tools on all fronts. Right now it's at the physical infrastructure level, which means survival, having a comfortable life, low cost existence, so you can focus on evolving to freedom. I mean, that's really what we're about. Um, so on the net neutrality thing, yeah, that was a inter very interesting thing regarding the FCC rules Federal Communications Commission and a, and a case coming up that might gut the net neutrality issue. So that's that's a very interesting thing. I just mentioned that with a, as we provide open source access to low cost tools, probably one of those tools that we're going to be providing, like maybe a decade or two two decades from now, is is the internet backbone. Like we always have to be vigilant about you know who actually owns the the internet. That's a that's a big and interesting question. But anyway, getting back more to the the meeting here, uh, let's go to some of the progress that's being made. So, so first of all, Lex, would you mind uh, filling us in a little bit on um, OSC Dev Workbench? What the latest on that is? Yeah. So I I, I paused a little bit on the uh, on wrapping up the chat uh, feature because I wanted to get some of the PLM stuff also uh, kind of start on it. Okay. Uh, in case there's changes on the virtual. so. In the screenshot, if you go to uh, yeah. page four, yep. um, I have the uh, sort of a prototype, I guess you could say, of the uh, of the panel that will be for uh, searching for parts, opening parts, saving, locking parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the drop down, I forgot to actually expand it, but in the drop down, you can select uh, parts if you want to filter by parts or by product, so like machine itself, hmm. or by um, you can search everything, or you can also just view. The currently locked parts, and so locked part basically means somebody's currently working on it, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to see like what's what's currently being worked on, um, and then you'll be able to double click to download, single click to like view description, and then under properties will be uh, you know maybe links or or all kinds of other things, and then under preview it will be a screenshot um, of of the part. So that, the idea is that you can quickly browse through parts without having to also download the, uh, the pre-cat files. Okay. Uh, and then history history will be just, uh, you know, every time you save it creates a history point. Uh, so what I'm thinking is initially when you connect to the uh, to OSC dev, it will download 
all of the parts so you'll have them locally and you can kind of browse through them and then because uh, that sh it shouldn't take very much space on the computer and, and the previews can be just you know pngs uh with low low quality pngs uh that way you can you know search and stuff and, and look at things without having to download all of the precad uh-huh so this would be so download, for example, say we're working on a micro track and everything is stored in separate files to, th that's the parts, like when you lock a part, would, how are you actually going to implement that? Is it going to be individual files? So it's really file management or it's like within FreeCAD that you're locking things within FreeCAD? It's going to be a little bit of both. Basically, um, it's, the locking prevents saving. So if, you, if two people open a file, one of them locks it and then they make changes and then they save which then unlocks it the other person who who did not lock it or was editing while you were editing they would get uh, basically they would have to you know merge merge their changes they won't be able to submit um, so it basically tracks it so that it's linear so that the history is linear because we can't really do merging you know there's no automatic merging with, with cash files so that's what the lock is for it's just to make the history linear okay but but make sure that when people uh, are locked out of, of saving, they can still save on their local disk, right? Because you don't want to get a crash. Yeah, so, so the way, basically what would happen is I would create a folder on their local computer and then as you double click on things, I download to the folder and then open the file. So yeah, it, it, it'll, be, um, uh, it'll be pretty simple as, as far as, like you could view the files that, that this plugin has, or this uh, workbench uh, has downloaded locally. Uh, uh huh. Uh, do you have any documentation like like your design rationale for this, like your algorithm, for? Yeah, it's, it's on the on the wiki. So it's uh, uh, what's the page on that? OSC Dev Workbench, I think. Uh, let me see. Yeah, OSC Dev Workbench. So let's see what you're documenting for, as far as because it would be important to maybe have some feedback on. Um, let's see. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could comment on some of that because it's going to be like that's going to get tricky as far as how that workflow is actually implemented. So maybe, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I documented pretty thoroughly, in, in, uh -huh. I think, you know, as far as the, every step and, and whatnot. Okay, okay, that's pretty good. So, yeah, we can maybe review that. So, if people have comments on that and questions, we should do that. Um, ask questions and make comments on this. Um, maybe people want to basically comment after this. So comment, maybe like leave a no. Like I'll put comments on OSE Dev Workbench on page two. So maybe people can document that within this working doc for this team meeting, um, that would be useful. Maybe comment like, you know, edit, you know, do the talk page, discussion page on the LSE dev workbench or um, can we maybe embed, like what I like to do is, uh, uh, you guys know discuss, right? Um, Discuss is the embed where you have the discussion at the b bottom of any page. You can actually add that to the wiki. You can go to discuss.com and you can add. So basically you make the page interactive. You've got uh, questions back and forth or this basically this, this embedded discussion thread on a wiki page. That would be useful, I think, on this particular page since this would be, you know, this if this works for us, I mean, this is a major improvement, major, you know, major progress happening on a project here. So, should uh, keep the discussion live on that. How are you feeling about the uh, Lex about the progress on that? I mean, do you think it's going to be relatively easy to implement what you're outlining on the OSC Dev page, like the the entire steps one through five, or no, you have basically minimal viewable product one, two, three, the parts catalog, like the parts catalog. Is that going to be relatively straightforward? Or how long do you expect that would take? So one and two are pretty much done. Mm -hmm. As far as three, let's see, part two is done. So that, what you see in the screenshot, that's actually already talking to the database and, and going back and forth. Um, so, so that part is working. As far as locking, that, that's going to be pretty easy to do. Um, so basically the only major thing left that I haven't uh, sort of 
fleshed out yet is talking to Amazon Cloud to upload and download the files. But I don't see that being too complicated. And mm -hmm. then the last difficult thing is actually um, uh, oh, on the server side doing the part processing. So if you see that, there's a separate section for part processing. So making thumbnail, generating a WebGL, calculating part time for printable parts, and mm -hmm. making STL for dip. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing left that, that's particularly challenging. It's just a lot of work to get it all done. Um, yeah, as far as the the various server processing functions like generating sketches, thumbnails, or SDLs for diffs or whatever, uh, where is that going to happen? Is that local? Uh, it'll or? be on OSC Dev. Okay. Okay. Well, so it, it wouldn't be possible to do it local because you'd need a lot of uh, dependencies and libraries and things for generating. So the screenshot we can generate locally because I can do that within FreeCAD when you hit save. Um, so okay. that's pretty easy because that way you can also position it just how you want. Um, but for for the other stuff, that that wouldn't make sense to do. Um, like for example, generate like if we wanted to do a, a calculate the print time for printable parts, then it means that you need more than just FreeCAD. You need to have the Cura, Cura software. And, and yeah. Okay. And then for STL. And, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's more, pretty good. That's more longer term, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. As far as like I'm a base... A, a, a couple more weekends, and I think um, maybe two or three more weekends, and I think I'll have a working prototype that we can start trying. So start trying, meaning that we're actually working on a file, and that file is uploaded to OSC Dev? It, it, it resides, like yes. the working files at OSC Dev, and then what you work from there? Yeah, well, it, w it would reside on uh, Amazon Cloud, but yeah. So the metadata would be on OSC Dev, but the files themselves would go up to uh, uh, to Amazon Cloud because it's it's you know it'll get we're, we're gonna end up with a lot of data I think pretty quickly. So yeah, we're gonna be tracking each version. Okay, wow, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, let's see, let's see. Uh, thanks. That sounds like major progress on that. All right. Um, okay, next topic. So, next topic uh, from page one is microtrack field testing. So, if you look at page six, that's the current state of the microtrack. So, basically, I added the, all the hose protectors and a platform for the rider on the back. And I took it out for a little spin, but uh, I'm going to actually change out the hydraulic pump because it's a 0.92 cubic inch hydraulic pump. It only gets us when you do the calculations to 2000 psi like actually 1950 PSI because we don't have enough engine power so I'm gonna s switch out that because it basically doesn't have enough torque to to move on uh, move effectively I'm gonna switch out to a smaller hydraulic pump uh, from going from 0.92 which is 14 gallons per minute to 0.67 which is uh, about 10 gallons per minute so we have more torque basically reworking that hopefully get the tractor back out to micro track back out there tomorrow because what I'm actually doing here is digging some some drainage so that would be the first test I, I try to do that but no we just don't have enough torque on the, the way it is ex with the uh, the smaller hydraulic motors and uh, basically uh, can't get the full pressure out of the pump because the engine is too small for the large pump that we got Sh the pump should be smaller so that's what I'm doing um, that's where we're at with that and uh, usability testing. I mean, I think the the platform on the back that's pretty comfortable, and I can s I stand on that and have the levers in front of me. That's pretty pretty comfortable uh, and pretty stable. So that's that's pretty good. But moving forward on that, uh, that's a brief report. Okay. So next, um, let's maybe go into a little bit on uh, Ahmed. Are you are you there on the meeting here? Okay, yeah, you can speak up. So how are things on your side? I know you're working on a, on a D3D for yeah. the Saudi Arabia build. Okay. Everything's ready, but just uh, the test, uh, my issue here that I've seen before, yeah. that uh, uh, it goes out, when it starts breaking start out, out of the heat deck. Uh, but you sent me an email right now regarding this issue. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, I, th I think I, before I tested also, I, I make it in the other way. I put the 
because the problem here is not about the, 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 that it's renting outside. It take the home in the right position, then it goes at the end of uh, at more than the, the hit that white neck like that. I don't know quite what. Uh, are you sure you got, are you using the proper initialization file? The, the, have yeah. you, you did the .ini file that's for D3D? Yes. You have it's that? It's already downloaded with, uh, with uh, Linux, right? Um, it should be in there. It should be. So, that should be working then. So what's the main question on your side then? My issue here, uh, why, uh, okay, take the position at zero point exactly as I needed. Uh -huh. But when it stopped printing, it stopped again to take a zero, okay, in the same position. Then the extruder or the buzzer goes in the middle of the heat bed and stops to take a zero again. Okay. Then it moves until the end of the Y uh, axis, which is more the, the, the heat bed. Uh, okay. Area and start blending out, start to take a zero. And when I, I make a fake, like, say, like, some like, uh, initialize of uh, some like a fake uh, zero, it starts to blending right. Okay. Why take uh, it more in Y access what moves more than needed? All right. I don't Did you get my last communication okay. regarding the the proper geometry? Yes, I, I, before I think, I think I have made that before. I made it, uh, yeah. But it's also useless. Uh, the email I just sent you like an hour ago, or, yeah? Yeah, I know. Yeah, but I'm looking uh, at your I, picture, I, your I, picture. I right. Um, but the picture that you're sending me, that's not the same geometry as the yeah. official geometry. So you, when you correct that, I think it should work. Uh, okay, I'll make it again tomorrow, but I think I, I tested before and I, I faced the same issue. No, but no, no, I, I'm, I'm, looking, I, I'm looking at your physical machine that you took the pictures of. Yes. yes, and the arrangement of the axes is not what it needs to be. Like the, for example, the you have the extruder pointing um, like... Not in the, the y-axis motors, it does side. Right. It yeah. It needs to be changed a little bit. That like for example the. Uh, yeah, both the X motor and extruder motor need to be pointing. When you're looking from the front, they need to be pointing back. What I see you happening, what's happening here? They're pointing to the front yeah. of the machine. So you got to reverse that. That's a, that's a start. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, but look okay, at I'm that. I, yeah. So the official geometry is on a D3D. Marlin page in the first photo right yes yes in the working document there the geometry meaning which which mo way the motors face and all of that stuff that's described in there has to be identical to that for for the actual code to work okay but yeah i think you have to do that so uh fix that and see where we go from uh, there yes but by the way uh mm -hmm. the first slide in this one uh exactly as i think as i made it Okay, uh, which is I think that you know that uh, this is not the right way. Okay. So I check. Yeah, I'll okay. take a look at your uh, pictures uh, again, and I'll make more specific comments on that. Because um, when I looked at the pictures that you have, I saw that immediately that unless you changed it already, unless these are old pictures. No, I didn't change it. I keep it as it is. Okay. Okay. I'll comment more explicitly on your pictures then. And okay. Get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, next, then let's go to the next topic, which is, um, so life track and the work on there. Uh, so Abe and Roberto, do you guys have any updates to make? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Well, um, I uploaded a new, a new version for the life track and I, I don't know if you can see. I, right now I'm not in my in my computer, so I can, cannot show, show you. Okay. But I just uh, I just update, updated the tensioner and changing to the stride uh, feeding. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, so for everybody looking at that Roberto log, download the MasterCAD for LifeTrack, LT MasterCAD. Mm -hmm. For the feeding. Yep. Yes, and, and also I changed the, um, the position for the lo loader arm shaft. And, and I move it uh, backwards. Uh huh. And enlarge the, the arms. And change um, the, the, the arms to the inch okay okay does it look like um, it's working oh, well you can see at the, at the final um, the, last, the last part of the review you can see the geometry in a sketch if you okay show, uh, show it's hidden right now but if you show that you can see together with the in the front Okay. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I'm opening it up right now, and um, that's good. Abe, how about on your side? Anything? I've been working on the power cube, and I think I've got all the specs and stuff. For other than that, I started kind of with the, the main power cube, the mother cube, that's going to feed the others. And I, I saw Roberto's changes, I think, the other day that was uh, kind of surprising. It looked like we've got five power cubes back there, and that, that larger power cube was on top. It's presumed to be the main power cube. But I don't think that the, the main power cube necessarily has to be any bigger. First, I thought I was going to have to enlarge it, but it looks like technically everything should fit in there. The larger um, uh, cooler, and the cooler, the only issue, and as the cooler well fit, like on the side, by the motor, where it would, um, you know, the airflow would cool it that way, if we were to do the, the fanless design on the main cube, but it, it's going to block that center, it's going to be pretty close there, and I think there are, let's see, well, there's the, you know, the air, obviously the air intake is there, so having that cooler there means you probably have a hard time accessing things on that side of the engine to do maintenance. I think there's a, a, a dipstick for oil on that side. It looks like there's one on the other side too. One maybe the drain and the other for fill or something. I'm not I'm not sure about that on the engine, but it, it that would be the only reason to like maybe increase the size of the cube width because you could, maybe you could get in between the cooler and the engine, but it probably wouldn't help that much. It's kind of like you'd have to move the cooler <laughs> to get to the engine to do maintenance. Uh-huh. Right. Let's see. Okay. Um... Let's see, so so you've got the, just to update where you are, so you've got the, what's the state, I, I'm, I'm downloading the, let's see, the frame module, PC1708 frame module, is that the, the status of that is pretty much, That's, you've got uh, everything in there, or is that the file I want to be looking at? I, or? Yeah, I haven't added, uh, I need to add the parts in there yet, uh, well, I, I redid the frame, so what I worked on a bunch of the, frame to kind of make it more editable because I figured I may need to change that a bunch and the other one wasn't as easy to edit so I tried to get that reworked so it was easy to change it based on the, the sketches kind of with the same method that uh, we were using on some of the other files recently Just trying to perfect that that method to some extent but um, it's the frame and, and I looked at I think I did have a part or a cube in there at one point to represent uh, I looked at the old one to kind of get all the measurements and everything, obviously, but it it didn't look like that. There's enough space for the cooler. It's well, the full extent of the cooler, 25 by uh, 17, I think. But then, uh, presumably, either top, probably at the top, there needs to be maybe. It might need to be elbows. I mean, obviously, this main cube 
is going to go on top. So if there's things that stick up above, up top, then they won't really be in the way. But if you wanted to put something else up there, they might be. So it's trying to keep it all in the cube. So there might need to be elbows or something different on the connectors on that cooler. Uh, I noticed there was quite a bit of um, connections on the other cooler. It looked like there had to be a bunch of parts on there to adapt it. For some reason, it looked like almost four inches of... Uh, parts for the plumbing off of the cooler so I don't, I don't know elbows I assume would work to keep it in a lower profile and keep the, the frame the same size I think which which is the file I want to be downloading for the final version of the big power cube the frame what I have so far. Okay. Um, so yeah, it is. Yeah, it's. Yeah, right. Seventeen oh eight frame module. Okay, and as far as like all the details, you're. Um, so right now that frame is gonna be, a little wider. No, it's still the same. But how are you gonna fit the cooler in there? If it's still twenty inches though. Um, it's uh, twenty five by. 17 and I I believe I've got I, I didn't think the tank needed to be any bigger for any reason so it it fits in on the side which I thought is what we would do on the side by the motors air intake so that it could be fanless right because I the idea with the larger cooler is that it's big enough and a little bit of airflow from the engine well make it function okay as heat. Okay, I have to take a look at the details of of your what you documented on your log, but right now, um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, I'll comment on that. I'll, I'll get you feedback on what you've got there uh, so far. Uh, so you're moving forward on the on the frame module for the new larger power cube, which is good. Yeah. I I figured out a lot of the, the math and spacing on some of that, I think. It, I just haven't got mm -hmm. the, started putting the parts together yet. I need to draw the cooler and all that yet. Okay. Um, but I think, I think I thought through the logistics and, and the, the spacing on it enough that it, it should be close. Okay, okay. And we can, um, yeah, let's, let's uh, review that. I'll... Um, the next question would be on the, the smaller cubes, they're, uh -huh. they're, uh, the cubes that feed, those obviously could be uh, smaller, I guess, if we wanted to, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, they, I mean, they don't need a tank, right, at all? No, they don't. You can, we can, so this, the, what we discussed last time was the possibility that even though the yeah, I mean, one, one of, well, actually, we didn't discuss this last time, but we, we know that the cooler can be in front of the air intake, which has a lot of airflow. But what if the, we eliminate the need for the, the electricity altogether or, or eliminate a lot of it if we put the coolers but not the tanks on the smaller power cubes? That would be one way to go as well. Uh, it would add cost in terms of more coolers, and the coolers are about 100 bucks, so it's not... Not that cheap. I mean, if you've got five power cubes or four power cubes, it's four hundred dollars in coolers. But that would be one way to address the issue as well. If we were looking, you know, looking dearly for ways to avoid, well, avoid using extra chargers or having solar panels uh, because we were missing electricity to run the coolers. So yeah, the small power cubes can have a cooler, but no no tank that's another option i'm not i'm not sure if that's a great idea but it's it's an option that we can consider in this whole mix as well yeah it, it's kind of hard to think about the whole the whole process because i was kind of worried about how we change the power cubes too much because i mean they're supposed to be a modular yeah. complete system right we're kind of changing it up so that they're dependent um although i guess you could take the smaller cubes and, and hook them to other cubes if you're going to have that, you know, mother cube and then feed, you know, okay. the design 
that way on all the tractors or implements. Yeah. So what what we have to do in this case, yeah, there's a lot of questions as far as okay, how best to address the modularity question. So what I think we should do is next is do a design rationale document saying, okay, these are our design decisions for how we're going to approach and to address the modularity for the cases of a single power cube up to multiple power cubes. Um, because we're kind of like bouncing a lot of ideas around and we kind of want to get that logic down so at least people can see it and comment and, and we can keep refining that document. So if you wouldn't mind, maybe start a, start a design rationale document. Um, maybe if you can just embed it in your, your work log where we say, okay, here's the designs decisions we are making and why for the power cube. Because th there is actually a lot of different moving parts in there. Like from, uh, there's just, it's, it's like the heart of the whole system, really. I mean, the power is the heart of a system. So uh, we should clarify those, those thoughts instead of just, um, well, add that to our CAD. So in addition to the CAD, we have, okay, here's, you can follow the design decisions that have been made. Can you do that? I'll start a doc. Yeah, we, we can, that. yeah, and then share that. Uh, email me that so I can start contributing to that as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we can continue on that. Let's go back just a little bit to the, so now to the, the tractor, the big tractor. Um, we're seeing, yeah, quite the... Uh, I'm looking at it on my screen. I downloaded the file and it's being recorded so you can look at it in the video, but I can't share my screen. I don't think I have the bandwidth here. Um, but yes, yeah, so wow, that's um, so Roberto, the, the geometry that you drew for the raised position is that the actual working? Um, that's how far the cylinders would extend? They look like it looks like. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. That's really high. And the. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the height of the rising rising bucket is um, 100 inches. Wow, <laughs> that is pretty tall. So, yeah, I mean that what you've done. So, are you happy with the design? Do you think there's a lot of uh, that would work, or? Uh, there, there's uh, uh, just a, one thing that I, I I'm not sure about is the. Um, position of the, of the shaft for the other cylinders. Uh-huh. You see it's just above the tensioner, so I'm not sure yeah. if the tensioner is going to oh, I see. be so, so high. Or... Right, I see. Um, wow. Well, what happens if you move the... I like how low the loader arms are right now. That's really good for stability, but can you raise them a little bit or no? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, we can. We might have to yeah. do it. I mean, we're going to have to have enough travel for the tensioner. Like, I would suggest, uh, I mean, at least 8 inches, but more like 12, that we should be able to travel up with the tensioner. I would say, like, 12 inches is probably a good idea, so it's easy to put the track on and when it's loose and then tension it so it's uh, you get enough tensioning happening there. Uh, right now, it appears that you have... When I look at that, you might have about eight inches of rays. We definitely want to add like four more probably. Um, but if you add four inches more, I mean, you could do that pretty much readily, right? Sorry, say it again. I think it's about 11 inches or a little more. I remember the shaft. 16 inches above the, the horizontal frame. Um, I'm in a picture in the download that I just did. The shaft is only 12 inches above. Ah, okay. did, you, did you change that and didn't upload the last version, or I'm looking at it, it's basically three. It's on a fourth hole, but that means it's really. I mean, the fourth hole is only uh, 12 inches, like the bottom, it's, it's really that space is only 12 inches there. Um, you think you have the latest upload, uploaded? No, no, it's okay, I, I just, uh, I, I didn't remember. 
Yeah, no, it's like in the picture right now we have what I'm seeing, unless I'm missing something, because of the thickness of the tensioner, we only got like about eight inches of motion, vertical motion up, like four on the bottom and four on the top of the tensioner. Um, yeah, but no, this is, this is, I mean, that's pretty good for geometry. Like, I mean, as far as the raise height, uh, now, is there anything wrong with that? Like, it looks like the cylinders are really, really <laughs> stretched vertically very, very high. But, yeah, I mean... They are, they are um, 36 inches cylinders. And for the curve, uh, they are 14 inches cylinders. Right. Uh, well, I mean, at 36 inches, I mean, it. <laughs> I'm trying to get used to the way it looks because it looks like super tall, but I think it's good. Right? I don't... Can anyone else comment? I mean, it looks really, really odd, but it looks like it works, too. I, I mean, I'm just kind of... Um... amazed at the the kind of the odd look of this but i don't see technically that there's anything that does wouldn't work about it now the cylinder goes from pretty much horizontal to vertical in how it's um arranged from the lowered to the higher to the raised position but i don't think that's there's anything wrong with that and let's see you've Marcia, got can you post us can you post a screenshot into the um yeah. document of what you're looking at oh yeah that's a good idea there let me just do that and that's a way to do it without with only 1.5 meg on the internet it's because we ran over the quota here we've got 25 meg HughesNet, but then when you run over the quota it gets you down to 1.5 meg and that's what i have but let me copy and paste it So copy. There it is on page five. So look at it. I mean, it, I mean, you can download this off of Roberto's log. That's his latest CAD file. Um, but. Outside of looking somewhat odd, I think that's actually, you know, I don't see why that wouldn't really work. Can anyone else see why that wouldn't work? I mean, we'd have to raise it just a little bit for the tensioner. But man, that would be some mean reach towards the top. All you need to do is clear the cab as far as the, the bucket goes, and it's clearing the cab. Because that's the ultimate position. When you're at the top position, you can shake the bucket and you kind of make things fall even further in front of you. But as long as they clear the cab, we should be okay. You can pull up, you know, say you're loading into like a dumpster or, you know, something, or you're using pallet forks, you know, pallets, you're stacking pallets very high somewhere up there. Um... Yeah, I mean, for dumping, it looks good. Any other comments by anyone else? I mean, I, I don't know. It, I like it. Um, I'll think about it more, but, but yeah, that looks, looks, um, looks interesting. And as far as the attachment of the front, oh, yeah, so you've got that issue on um, where the loader arm, the, the bucket cylinders are attached they kind of you have this raised position but i think if you raise the arms uh, by like say four inches to get the 12 inches of travel on the on a tensioner i think you'll be okay there yeah but that that uh, i just um just put the, the arms that way for simplicity because the those attachments can be different i i just want i just put um one plate but in the real uh, build it can be two plates yeah so there's no there, there would, would not be problem with the cylinders yep and what about what was the happened to the idea of potentially attaching the cylinders to the bottom pin of the male quick attach as opposed to the top yeah i, I still not uh, try that option 
you yeah. still are you still hopeful uh, about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, 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 uh, I can try and see what happened because mm -hmm. the the, load, the other arm is going to be attached to the, the the first hole, the back in the quick attach plate, main plate, and to get that that uh, height in the right position, I need more more height in the shaft also. Or, so. The, the, the loader arm shaft should be should have uh, should be should have to be I don't know what to say but it has to be um, rised also to oh yeah I right you understand it. Uh, you mean like if are you saying that if we raise the tensioner the main part of the loader arm has to be raised a little bit as well The first hole, right, yeah. The you're saying the first hole where? Like, uh, can you draw? Oh. The, uh, male, yeah. the male quick attach. Oh, if it the was in a bottom hole. Attached. You're discussing yeah, the yeah, difference right, between the right. bottom hole and the top hole. Yeah. Uh huh. That's right. Okay. Well, I mean, I would say if this is working, I think maybe we just leave that. Um, what would happen if you raised the the long part of the loader arm a little bit like four inches would the geometry still work out to get you the the good raise height yeah yeah the, the might even be better right perfectly impossible yeah yeah, yeah right maybe the, the bucket can be even closer to the cap in the lower position <laughs> yeah then as doubles as a cherry picker <laughs> no, like one of those devices where, yeah, you really get things up pretty high. Yeah. No, that's pretty good. And that that place where you have the shaft going through the power cubes, that you know that that could work. I don't see why not. Um, right now, I'm experimenting with how easy it is to take power cubes in and out of the frame. What I had to do is basically with a micro track, I took a hoist. And I simply lifted the power cube out of the receptacle, uh, out of its where it sits on a micro truck. So it was pretty easy uh, because, as I said, I'm replacing the hydraulic pump. So that was quite manageable. And I'm thinking about ways that we can make this so, like, once you have four power cubes to manage on the back of this, that's still doable. Like, if you have to repair one of them, it, you don't have to take apart the whole tractor. And right now, I mean, I, I think we're we're on track to do that it's you know it'll be easy to take off the two power cubes on the top and then you can you know take off the two bottom ones i think that wouldn't be too hard it's basically like maybe bolt them on so they stay in place you can take them right out um like say you have engine failure you, you can replace a power cube readily you have you know you possibly have a store of a few extra power cubes lying around and then you can replace them or even add more power to this if you want you know yeah yeah um so what would be the next steps for you roberto um i i'm going to start with the 3d printer i think okay 
Okay, so leave this where it is right now, maybe make some minor adjustments. Okay, okay. So we can finish that up once we have more of the specifics on the power cubes. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. I mean, what we have right now looks like, you know, outside of just raising the, raising for the tensioning by four inches, I think we are all good. So uh, that's a definite step we do want to do. So would you mind just doing that element and then move into the 3D printer? Just to ra can you raise that? Uh, allow the tensioner to go up a full 12 inches and then oh, yeah, yeah. yeah finish yeah, that yeah, one step that, up that I, I sorry yes. yeah yes. okay okay that sounds good that sounds good yeah yeah I mean that's um, and then we can examine this maybe more carefully see if we identify any issues that we have to change but no that's that's pretty good I think that's pretty good. All right. Um, what else we got here? So, uh, so that's the f main topics for today. Anything else that we want to bring up? Because otherwise, we can wrap up the meeting and uh, continue next week. Uh, next week being twenty eighth. I think there's questions that were in there before, and I okay. Okay, let's go over through some of the some of the questions. Um, is the kitty log question still relevant? Uh, that was my question. I mean, I guess it's optional to answer or not. I was just curious. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, that looks like what? What is it? Charles. I guess would be the first question. Yeah, I mean, to me it looks like, um, so it's a bunch of stuff like October 7th, I've not, yeah, I don't know what that's about, but I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's like, it's spam, isn't it kind of like spamish in that it just took old articles and just put them in on a wrong date? It looks kind of spammy, but I mean, we could just let it go, just keep our eyes out on it, but... Uh, it's basically taking a lot of content from a long time ago and just reposting it under current dates. So it's technically like spammy. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, it's just reposting old content. I don't know what the purpose of that is. Can anyone see a purpose of... It says it was done by Charles? Yeah. Yeah. No, it looks like maybe we just have to cut that out, see if, you know, just kind of keep our eyes out, eyes out on it, but maybe just, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's not, it's not hurting too much, but, um, uh, there might be some hidden purpose that we're missing about that. I don't know. Um, okay, but let's, let's leave that for now. Watch some of the videos of Microtrack. Notice RPMs of the engine drop a lot when the hydraulics are activated to change direction. My car power steering pressure switch broke today and I learned that the power steering pressure switch feeds information of the demand and power steering to the engine control module. How complex would it be to have a feedback mechanism like this installed on a tractor? Um, well, I think it's it would require some work, but I think the first things first... Um, feedback of how much yeah I mean that's getting into like like sensing and automation we're not there yet really we think the first step would be um, before we get into sensing of like you know like a, an engine gauge which tells you how much pressure you have like in real time I mean that's all good but yeah I guess one step at a time so it's probably good work for sometime in the future and of course if we get more people on the team then you know we can start looking at sensors things like that that is relevant to you know Arduino sensors and automation aspects so 
uh, but we're not there yet. I think I think we are getting there with things like the GPS tractor, which is in pro in process. So uh, definitely related, but maybe not immediately on a plate. Uh, Abe saying feedback network meeting related to the shop aid. I think info on the wiki may be added, but if there hasn't been a recent research into available local ISPs, it would be good to do occasionally in case there's a com competitive local provider to to the the expensive slow DSL. Um, uploads, yeah, 0.5 meg uploads is what we have. So, considering OSC is a networking reliant organization, is critical to enabling more sharing of data and better quality communications. Abe, Abe, you bring up a good point here. And this, this, um, and as I mentioned, I was thinking about the internet issue here, because the bottom line is, while Moore's law is is going for well for computers it totally has not worked over the last decade for this this site where the internet speed has not increased one bit here um, on our side at least so to actually to look at exhaustively into what what's possible here might be an option like between I mean even hotspots like I know Verizon has a has decent service here and I actually looked at their hotspots or getting even a cell phone with unlimited data that cell phone could could beam like 3G or 4G internet I mean that would be you know 4G is in principle uh, not bad like like I, I I read some reports like in rural areas of Maine they had like 20 meg and 2, two meg upload you know so so I think we we do want to research this a little bit um, a little bit more I uh, don't have an easy solution right now, but it is it is true that we we need to find better solutions. I mean, whether like satellite or something, but yeah, right now we're kind of yeah. Into that, some, yeah. that was like a couple of weeks ago when we kind of discussed that. And yeah. Since you brought that internet stuff up today, yeah. Thought about it again. It's yeah, not, it's true. I guess an immediate priority, but I I don't. I guess you mentioned satellite too, and yeah. I, I guess the wiki is out of date on that because that's what I wasn't certain. It sounds like you're using satellite, but I, of course I wouldn't suggest satellite because usually, in my experience, satellite it's hard to use for any kind of communications because of the latency. It's like usually almost a few seconds of latency, or there's so much jitter that you can't do yeah. like good audio communications. Yeah, that's um, actually not true I did because. Find yeah, that part actually is not true. That's the one part that did improve. I remember a long time ago there was satellite here. Right now I'm talking to you on satellite. And I'm talking on a slow, the 1.5 meg of the satellite because the the regular is 25 meg. But that's download, so upload is slower than 1.5. But allows no latency appears on the, on the Jitsi meet. And that is HughesNet. But I'm just like, if the Moore's Law is really working for communications, I mean, I think there should be more competitive services out there. Like, it's, it may be that in a few years that will appear, or, you know, even next year or something. So, so that the satellite has improved definitely. Like, I didn't see any issues. Um, like, before, I know what you're talking about. You couldn't do Skype or anything that was real time back and forth on a satellite, but now it appears you can pretty much. And with satellite yeah. has improved, and my understanding is that in the future there's companies talking about doing low orbit satellite where it will be competitive with fiber, like 25 milliseconds. But nobody's launched, you know, thousands of satellites yet to do that. But the cost is going down, and they're suggesting that there's a bunch of companies considering that. Right. Uh, yeah. Give global internet there's technology that exists that could enable it to work really well but it hasn't happened yet and obviously there's terrestrial stuff and i looked um not like a mile away from you supposedly there's a local uh, a company that's like a, a subdivision of the local electric cooperative is supposedly installing gigabit fiber oh I yeah did yeah a search, search. it's supposedly all the way down past a, a dairy uh store or something that's nearby there okay yep it shows yep. on a map I no i think that on the wiki mm -hmm. and all the other thing was i found was their 
wireless company that's in the area, maybe from St. Joe, Missouri or something. And I, I just linked a few things there, but I didn't really do in-depth research on that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, just if, did some quick searches on those. Yeah, I mean, if you want to keep looking at that, that would be... Yes, uh, I am aware of that. I believe there's Google Fiber, like in Maysville right here, which is about a mile from us. So what that could mean is we could snap up a you know, little parcel of land over there or something, and then we could beam through, but you have to set up a tower. Like, but, but if we could get a gig connection and then set up a tower where we're beaming straight to here, uh, that would be an acceptable option. I mean, that would mean that we do have to put up a tower um, to, to get that. So basically you go from the Google Fiber to a wireless communication that's beamed over, over the air uh, through a tower. So that might be another option that would require some investment in infrastructure but yeah it would uh, possibly be worth it we'll, we'll see but um, yeah and then of course like if you if if there is that gigabit internet somewhere there well how do you actually you know connect to that like can you actually run a line I mean of course there's rights of way but I'm thinking about that like as we I think we should really learn up, like, what does it take to actually bury cables and connect to existing lines? Because um, there might be some options, like, like, you know, like as we gain access to the construction equipment, like the trenchers and tractors and all that heavy equipment that can do that, we can possibly do that for very low cost. Um, at least that's on my radar that we, sh we can and probably should be doing that in the future, just kind of with the net neutrality question. At, that it's important as far as who owns the internet. You know, say say net neutrality goes completely away. You know, it'll be time to get violent on that and start digging our own lines. You know, so um, yeah, we'll we'll see how that goes. If you can do some more research on that, and you know, um, if you have any concrete suggestions, um, we'd love to take them up. Um, right now, the only thing I would say is that I guess recent information. It's not very up to date because I didn't know about the satellite. I don't even know what specifically what package you have. It's not up to date on the wiki. So recent information about the network there, and I noticed that in was it a few years back, 2014, uh, somebody Benjamin I think was did a bunch of network stuff yeah. locally, and I think I understood all that, but it was kind of odd. And I I assume that the internal network there, it sounds like it's mostly okay I mean maybe a little better wireless or maybe a cable in one spot that needs to be trenched in or whatever to improve things but the ISP is is the bottleneck I mean yeah, if you're yeah. only if you actually only have half a megabit of upload on over DSL or any of the other things it, it it's limiting the ability to share information upload the asynchronous nature of it is, is annoying right and it did look like when I did some of the research, I, um, I did like look at the CenturyLink, and right, when I right. looked at that, it did suggest that they have an option for maybe for one megabit upload, but you know that that's not much more, and it probably costs a lot, uh, so it's probably not a, a nice competitive solution. Right. I wasn't aware that we can get one meg upload. They told us only that we can have the 4 and 0.5. 4 download and 0.5 upload. Yeah. So. And that's yeah. the problem is sometimes they, they don't know. They advertise things and then you have to talk to them locally and sometimes they get it wrong. Right. So. And this begs the question like, okay. It mostly. Yeah. I think mostly it's to put in lines and things like that. It's hard because it is mostly the red red tape itself. Because you need to like buy service from one company and they have to allow that. And of course they always charge more. Um, but there there is that one wireless company locally. It's almost always about population density in the rural areas and the cost. Uh, maybe all you would need to do to to get wireless would be to have somebody rent an antenna on a like on a large building in town or something right, that right. has fiber and then it would have to have rights to resell that and you just have two antennas and that would be 
great, but a lot of times there's there's all kinds of red tape and, and contract issues and so on. Right. The minor is that a lot of the lack of connectivity between uh, ISPs and internet companies, they'll, they'll have different networks in the area and they're not interconnecting because they, what's called transiting costs, they, they want to be fairly equal. And large ISPs, if they're sharing an equal amount of data with each other, then they just do it for free. They just cost of equipment, link the fiber together, and they're good to go because it just interchanges equally. But uh, these other ISPs, the small ISPs and the bigger ISPs, they don't they don't want to pay to interlink with each other. They, they want to charge too much. And of course, there's cost of maintenance of like a, a an interchange. I guess they call it a IXP or something cross points so that it's you know it's more interconnected like a web which would you would expect but it's 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 not currently they're more anti-competitive to some degree right yep okay well uh some more more research is needed on this topic i'd like to know what exactly like um you know to talk even more rationally to the to the isps like what are the actual physical things you need to do like say yeah like how do you connect to the lines what what exactly does it take just understanding the, the hardware infrastructure a little bit more because there might be some options there that we might have uh i mean just i mean I'm, I'm literally thinking like what you know what if you actually do trench and go through rights of way uh to a fat to a fat pipe you know like is that actually realistic if we can actually do that work because co the company's going to tell you well we're not going to do that but what if you can actually do that uh, does that actually leave some new options there? So, yeah, we'll have to research a little more what um, what the options are. But yeah, anyway, um, that's an unresolved issue at this point, and definitely definitely is going to improve in the future. And uh, right now, it looks like the easiest solution would be uh, if we want to get really serious about it uh, is a tower, like yeah, beaming the internet off off a gigabit line. That would be at this point the most feasible scale up solution like if you actually get a gig you know gig you know 25 times you know, 20 now what is that a gig is 40 times more than what we currently have for the HughesNet um, satellite which is 25 meg I mean 40 times more well it would be really worth the investment to to get 40 times faster um, so we can really like stream you know do that real-time documentation from events and all of that kind of stuff so um, yeah okay um, that's about it for me uh, anything else that we want to cover I think that's about it so we'll leave it at that and look forward to next week's meeting then yeah um, sounds good okay Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right, bye.